Good afternoon. Around 160 of us are gathered for this land, sea and air decarbonising transport webinar. It's part of the Decarbonisation Week Virtual Sustainability Summit, a pre-COP26 event that features panels of experts prepared to share both opinions and knowledge, and that's certainly what we have here. I'm Judith Patton, Project Director and Co-Creator of All Energy and the co-located Decarbonise. With no in-person All Energy since 2019, we've run a compelling series of webinars, 30 between May 2020 and March of this year, now 24 in Decarbonise Week. Sadly, this is the final All Energy contribution to the week. Tomorrow, attention turns to sustainable oceans and on Friday, sustainable travel and farming. Forgive me if I use an extra second or two to thank the Workcast team and my own colleagues, Tina and Marianne, who are backstage for all the hard work they've put into our 15 sessions. One housekeeping point. Audience members, check what lies behind the resources tab. You'll see what's up next. Find a full programme link, the digital bag, and information on next May's All Energy and co-located Decarbonise. The dates for your diary <coughs> are the 11th and 12th of May at Glasgow's SEC. Naturally, we'd like to thank our sponsors. And for the first three days, these include our brand sponsors, Scottish Power, Shepherd and Wedderburn, and Ersted whose names you'll see alongside certain sessions close to their hearts. And this session has the Ersted logo against it. And thank you to our session sponsors, Hitachi ABB Power Grids, Kellis Midstream, SSEN Transmission, SWEP, and Driving the Electric Revolution Industrialization Centers. And thank you, speakers and audience members, for being with us. All webinars are available on demand. If not straight away, certainly you'll see this one by tomorrow. Spread the word. Now, without more ado, I'd like to pass over to our chair, Jane Cooper of Ersted, to give the sh get the show on the road. Over to you, Jane. Thank, thank you, Judith, and thank you for such a lovely introduction. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar. Um, my name is Jen Cooper. I'm the Director of Regulatory and External Affairs at Ersted in the UK. Um, and we've got a great panel for you this afternoon, and I'm excited to introduce them to you. But first, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce you to Scotland's Minister for Transport, Graham Day. We're living in a global climate emergency, we all know that. In just under a month, Scotland will host the world's leaders in the next UN Climate Change Conference, which is widely accepted as one of the last opportunities to protect the planet and humanity from the devastating consequences of climate change. The scale of transformation required to decarbonise is unprecedented. As a global community, we need to work together to make fundamental changes. We are playing our part in Scotland where with our world leading climate legislation, we're working to be at the forefront of the transition to a sustainable net zero economy. The challenges are very clear, but at the same time, this transition presents real opportunities if we have the courage and the vision to grasp them. Opportunities to build a just transition, reimagining the way we live, work and travel, building a future which is more sustainable and fairer than before. Across the Scottish Government, we're taking decisive action that does not shy away from transport's role as the largest emitting sector of the economy, but it is one that encourages a shift towards more sustainable travel options. We obviously need to see behavioural change, more active travel and a reduction in car kilometres travel. However, the decarbonisation of our transport should also capture the benefits of a transport technology revolution in Scotland. Because we know that technology will be vital for our transport system's mission to zero. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you to Graham Day for those for those words there. And I think picking up on his on his uh, point around the transport being the largest emitting sector, we will be talking about that this afternoon. So first, I'll introduce you to the panel. I'll say a few words and then we'll hand over. So Morna Cannon from uh, Transport Scotland. 
We have Dr. Russell Fowler from the uh, UK regulatory team in National Grid, Richard Crosser, Public Affairs Manager from Ersted UK. I'm a, unfortunately, Scott Madison is not well, so his colleague Ian Divers has actually has joined us this afternoon. So thank you, Ian, for stepping in at short notice. And Amanda Lyne, who's the Managing Director of ULMCO. Thank you. So this afternoon's discussion, so I work in the power sector and we've made great strides in the power sector. Uh, we've reduced 74% of our emissions since 1990 and about 65% in the last decade. So really we've, we've made great strides. And now that, as Graham has said, transport um, really needs to get underway. So since 2015, transport has been the highest emitting sector in the UK. And actually over the last decade or so, emissions have only fallen 1%, so it's been broadly flat. Um, electrification is going to be the uh, technology of choice to decarbonise light transport. And there will be other measures, you know, Graham spoke about behaviour measures, but there'll be high take up of FEVs, zero emission HGVs, um, re reduction in car travel, phase out of diesel trains. That's going to need, you know, behavioural change as well. Aviation emissions, actually, they were very, very low last year, as we know why. Let's not dwell on that. Um, but in the 10 years up to 2019, they were up by 7%. And we need to develop hydrogen and fuels to be actually derived from, hy derived from hydrogen in order to decarbonise heavy transport, uh, shipping and aviation. So over the course of the next hour, we're going to look at some of these issues with our, with our panel here. Um, please, please send in your questions and we'll get some good debate going and we'll, we'll try and answer all your questions and go away. You can all go away feeling more knowledgeable than when you first arrived. So thank you. And Mona, can I hand over to you, please? Thank you, Jane, and thank you, Judith, for opening the conference and, and for the introduction. I hope um, attendees can, can hear me. I'm joining remotely. Apologies, you can't see my video. But I am, I've got a presentation today which aims to give a, a brief overview of how we're approaching the decarbonisation of the transport sector in Scotland. And if we can load that up now, that's perfect. So if we can flick on to the, the next slide. Um, as other, others have said before, and as the, the Minister alluded to, transport is now Scotland's largest emitting sector of the economy. Um, as, as Jane has mentioned, emissions have remained flat from the transport sector within Scotland uh, over, the, over the last decade and more, while emissions from the energy sector have clearly come down, um, now making transport the largest contributor um, Within the transport space, and people around the table will be familiar, the, the road transport sector comprises a, 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 the lion's share of emissions, uh, but clearly challenges across the board to reduce emissions down to, to our targets for, for net zero. If, if we can move one slide on. So what does this concretely mean for transport in Scotland and what do our targets mean? That, the Minister for Transport gave a, a speech to the Scottish Parliament um, just last week or the week before, which set out some research that, that has been conducted for the Scottish Government, articulating um, what the, in, in a bit more detail what the challenge means. And really, that, that's looking like a, a, a core challenge for the next decade of having transport emissions. So having emissions in a decade really starts to focus the mind. If, if we can flick on to the next slide again. I think one thing that's noticeable about Scotland's approach to decarbonising transport is really that we're embedding from the start uh, an approach of uh, a, taking a, a view of the sustainable travel hierarchy. So we are clear that demand reduction has a concrete role to play in getting to net zero and we've committed to reducing car kilometres by 20% by 2030. Uh, for instance, uh, and are committed, of course, also to, to modal shift as a core part of the picture, uh, as set out in our climate change plan update and as set out in our national transport strategy. If we can flick one slide on. D this slide really just sort of tries to visualise where we're looking from a sort of modal shift perspective, and, and clearly we don't want to replace like by like um, fossil fueled cars with. Uh, EVs, we want to be getting people onto public transport and onto active transport um, as well. But 
for the purposes of today's conversation, I think that technology um, decarbonisation puzzle is, is really core to our conversations. So if we can flick on, I'll, I'll talk to some of that and where hydrogen might play a role. So we can move on one slide. So from a technology decarbonisation perspective, bearing in mind that even with the best will of the world and we're going to reduce demand and we're going to shift onto less polluting modes of transport, we still will be travelling via a range of, of um, private transport and public transport and, and those modes all need decarbonised from a propulsion perspective. Um, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the range of challenging targets that the Scottish Government has set uh, to take us towards net zero. I won't read them all out, but they're, they're there on the slide. So we've got key targets per mode. And, and across all of those targets, we're looking to take forward that um, step to net zero in a way which promotes innovation and investments in products and promotes a just transition for the Scottish economy as well. So creating green jobs, creating growth uh, and looking out for people and placing people at the centre of our transition. If we move on one slide. So where are we already? Well, we, we have um, a lot of actions across the piece, cross-modally. Um, again, I won't read the, these out, but there's a, a raft of actions on the left side of this slide, which just points to the investments that the Scottish Government has made, um, both in electrification of the transport network, particularly looking at the, the building of the Charge Place Scotland network for electric vehicle charging, right the way through to supporting research and demonstration on some heavier duty vehicle um, vehicles and components, as well as um, introduce the introduction of uh, research and development on, on hydrogen. And specifically focusing in on that hydrogen point, um, just wanted to, to flag to, to people today, of course, we have published as a, as a national government um, our policy statement on hydrogen last year, which set out our ambition to, to have five gigawatts installed capacity for green and blue hydrogen by 2030. Apologies if you can hear my doorbell in the background, I'm going to ignore that. Um, uh, we, we have also been looking to take forward um, demonstration projects with various vehicle modes. So, for instance, our bus demonstrations in Aberdeen and Dundee and with trains with, in partnership with ScotRail. Um, and we continue to look at electricity and hydrogen as complementary fuels um, for the decarbonisation of transport and have reflected that in our bus subsidy, um, our current bus subsidy scheme, which is open until November. There's just a couple more slides, so if we flick for I think the penultimate slide, where next, where do we see ourselves going in terms of the, the uptake of hydrogen and transport? We think it has a key role to play, um, both for the decarbonisation of transport, but also as a stimulus to a wider Scottish hydrogen economy. Um, we are currently investigating the demand for hydrogen and trying to forecast that, um, as well as the demand for electricity across all transport modes um, and across all parts of Scotland. And we have committed to setting out by 2022 a framework for enabling infrastructure to underpin our move to, to the zero emission transport system. And that includes a framework for the development of the hydrogen refueling system that will support that. Um, we will discuss these in, in more detail in our Hydrogen Action Plan, which will be published this year, and then again in the refresh of our Scottish Government Energy Strategy, which is due next year. And if I can end, uh, I'll close by flicking us onto the next slide and just saying that Transport Scotland is really keen to engage with all parts of the transport and um, the transport sector and with the energy industry to really get beneath these problems and, and understand what barriers there are to rolling out hydrogen across the transport network and what opportunities there might be and how we can collaborate in partnership with industry to, to make some of that a reality. We'll be talking in more detail about this at our transport conference as part of COP26, which is taking place on the 8th of November, uh, and then also at, our Dubai World, at the Dubai World Expo um, at the Scottish events in January. And I look forward to discussing them with you all um, as we go on through the conference today. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. Um, we'll take questions, we'll go around and then we'll take questions at the end, I think. Um, so, Mona, uh, thank you. And Dr. Russell Fowler, could I ask you to introduce yourself and uh, give us a, a short update on, on how, how you see the um, decarbonisation of transport? Hello, everyone. Yes, uh, my name's Russell Fowler. I'm from National Grid. I'm going to give a very brief overview of how we see 
uh, decarbonizing land, sea, and air. I do have a few slides to share, so you can bear with me a second. Hopefully, these will appear. There we go. Hopefully, people um, can see those. I say my name's uh, Russell Fowler. I look at transport decarbonization at National Grid. It's always worth saying who National Grid are because a lot of people have a view or an understanding of National Grid. Um, some people are unquite sure what that is. It's always worth clarifying what we do or more likely what we don't do. So um, we, we do do several things. So the thing that most people will know us for is owning the high voltage electricity system in England and Wales. So. Um, if you like a transport analogy, this is uh, the motorways and A roads of the electricity system. So the very large pylons and cables that you see across the country, the large substations as well. So there are some statistics there on um, how much physical infrastructure that we have. So the best way to think about this is moving the electricity from large power stations down into the kind of the more local grid. If, if you want the road analogy into your kind of B roads and local roads to take into people's homes. So that means that we don't own power stations, contrary to what you sometimes um, hear people say, uh, nor do we buy and sell electricity, again, contrary to what you people say, nor do we deliver it to people's homes, unless you have a very, very large demand. So unless you're a very large factory or a very large user of transport for uh, rail electrification, for example, there. Um, we also own the gas system in all of the, the um, UK, so Scotland, England, and Wales, and we've recently brought a distribution business. So this is the local wires that take electricity to your house. We also operate the electricity system in Scotland, England and Wales. So this is making sure that the electricity is balanced on a second by second um, basis. So supply and demand always matched there. There's lots of stats on this slide, so I won't read them out, but I will direct people to the reliability. This is one that we're very proud of at National Grid. So we have a very reliable electricity system in the UK. And that's why it makes sense to kind of look to uh, an electrified transportation system because you have a very reliable way to move energy off fossil fuels and onto the electricity system. We've, we've already seen several slides um, like this and say, well, why is there a need to decarbonize transport? But I, I think it's no harm to, to, to mention it again. We know transport is the largest polluting sector. It overtook the, the energy sector a, a couple of years ago, and you can see it's comfortably ahead of all of the other sectors there. So if we need to get our emissions down, we really need to focus on transport. I think everyone on the call agrees with that. Um, there's there's a, a, a few kind of more local issues that I'd like to, to pick in. So you have carbon reduction, which is absolutely crucial to do, crucial uh, that we get agreements in COP26 in, in a month's time. But there's also a kind of more local issue around kind of air quality. There are some statistics there again around premature deaths and sick days lost in, in the UK to poor air quality. Almost half of the nitrous oxide, so kind of poor air quality, if you like, is down to transport. And that's predominantly concentrated in urban areas and around areas of uh, Kind of classical low income as well so it's a real need to make sure that we improve air quality as well co2 reduction is important air quality is important as well and having clean transport is a real key way to get that of course there's also the potential economic gain there as well to making the uk a, a leader in electric vehicles and electric vehicle infrastructure so that's kind of why we're we're focused on this um so what, what do we do at national grid you may think well okay i i get you move electricity from the power stations to, to, to where it's gone. So how, how does that, that kind of work in reality? What's your kind of interest in transport? If we take a little bit of a step back on what we can do almost as a day job is um, connecting power stations. So historically, these were fossil fuel power stations, coal for, for fired power stations and gas fired power stations. But increasingly, it's renewables. So you've seen an awful lot of renewables connected to the system already but you've seen awful little more committed to by 2030. So uh, the UK has a target of 40 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. If you want a little bit of sense of scale of that, we currently have around 10 gigawatts of offshore wind. So that's a quadruple in of our capacity in 10 years and the associated infrastructure to connect all that in. So you have a huge increase in renewable power, which is absolutely fantastic, which you need to get that electricity system even cleaner. 
But of course, then that links into your transport as well. If we're going to have transport, we need to make sure we've got clean energy to supply that. And of course, that then leads to a collaboration between the energy and transport as well. So we need to make sure that the transport sector and the energy sector work hand in hand so we can deliver uh, this decarbonisation goal. Uh, and it's worth noting that we're, we're technology agnostic here. You may think, well, you're clearly leading towards electricity here. Um, the conversation we had previously on hydrogen, there's multiple routes that you can produce hydrogen. So you can produce hydrogen through electrolysis, so taking renewable electricity, taking water and then splitting the hydrogen out of that. Or you can take natural gas and you can kind of rip the carbon out of that, put that into the ground and then you use that hydrogen in a network, if, if you like. So this is the green hydrogen and the blue hydrogen. Both of those need energy infrastructure. So you need electricity infrastructure to get your electricity to produce your green hydrogen, and you need a, a, a gas network and then a hydrogen network for blue hydrogen. So energy infrastructure is crucial to whatever decarbonisation route that you go down. And if you look at a very high level, pathways to decarbonise transport, um, there's a kind of journey that goes on how, how we see it and it, it fits in nicely to land see it there we're all very focused on electric vehicles we know by 2030 there's going to be a ban of petrol and diesel sales uh, there's a piece of work called project rapid which national grid involved in so this is looking to create a network of ultra rapid electric vehicle chargers up and down strategic roads so charges where you go in charge up for 10 15 minutes and then carry on your journey so this over uh, comes range anxiety. So if you talk to people that don't have electric vehicles, one of the, the, the key things that they're, they're worried about is going on long journeys and range anxiety. So if you have a network of rapid chargers, you can hope overcome that as well. And as we move down there, we move into buses as well. So we already see hydrogen and electric buses there today. There's commitments by 2025 to make sure that only low or zero emission buses are purchased. So you can see that journey moving through heavier vehicles. We've seen recently 2035 and 2040 dates um, for the banning of diesel trucks and, and heavy goods vehicles. There's a potential actually do we need a rapid charging network for them as well. In, interesting area to debate. And then you move on to rail. We already have a lot of rail electrification. There's a lot more to be done by 2040 and 2050. Plus those kind of more challenging to get parts of the network where maybe you can't electrify that, you can't put that overhead line in. Are we talking battery? Are we talking hydrogen? We've already seen hydrogen trials. I believe there will be hydrogen train for COP26 as well. So lots of different ways that we could potentially help decarbonize rail. And then right up to the other end, how are we going to take maritime? How are we going to take decarbonization? So right up to that 2050 deadline. We know there's a jet zero strategy. This is evolving. Um, very low emissions fuels to try and get that kind of international uh, aviation down. But for the more domestic market, there may be um, electric planes or electric boats could be a possibility, or again, on hydrogen to get these done as well. So there's a real good opportunity to get those done. So that's me finished. Uh, here are my contact details. Really happy to help take questions later on, but I will hand on to the next speaker now. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Russell. Um, we couldn't do all this without the role that National Grid pays. Um, so that, yes, thank you for that. <laughs> um, now, Richard, handing over to my colleague, Richard Krosick. Hi there. Um, thank you. And actually, thank you, Jane. And actually, really good to be part of this panel again this afternoon. Um, it's a really interesting conversation. Um, and that's actually just a, an absolute perfect kind of um, stopping point there for me, because what I'm looking at today, and I'll, I'll come onto slides in a couple of minutes, but I just wanted to talk first, um, is looking at that kind of piece around aviation and shipping, that long-term piece, that piece that looks kind of out there in the 2040s, that looks slightly safer and something that we don't need to worry about now, but actually looking a little bit more about what we need to do to get there by 2040 and, and what we are doing here at Austin and with some of our other um, collaborators and consortium partners to try and make that a reality um, and something that we're very much going to need to start now to get there. Um, you know, so Russell mentioned that the decarbonisation, especially large scale shipping, large scale and long distance aviation, it has to be dealt with. It absolutely is an essential part of the net zero story. Um, you might be able to deal with it, um, deal with many, many other parts of the net zero story um, using hydrogen, electricity, etc. 
but this is something that almost certainly is going to require large amounts of synthetic fuel and those are fuels marine fuels or jet fuel which is derived from from hydrogen through various chemical processes um and i'm going to come along in a, in a minute just to explain one of the projects that we're involved in trying to to make sure that, that happens um and actually you know, i was looking at this beforehand what does what's the kind of predicted demand for synthetic fuel uh, i'm looking at bp's demand for example which i think is probably on the um, pessimistic side in terms of how far we're going to get there. Um, you know, they were talking about at least 25% of liquid fuel coming from low carbon sources. And of that, at least a third of that being synthetic fuel, the rest being made up of biofuel. Um, that might sound like low percentages, but when you look at how much jet fuel and shipping fuel and marine fuels are being used around the world at the moment, that is an absolutely enormous source of carbon, but also just an absolutely enormous amount of fuel that needs to be produced. Um, so from where I stood, as you might know, we're an offshore wind company. So everything we're doing is coming from offshore wind and renewables. Um, I wanted to introduce a project called the Green Fuels of Denmark project, which is looking at an example of how this can work. Let me just share that with me, excuse me. Hi. Um, so what you're seeing in front of you is actually just a picture of Copenhagen Airport, but it's the, the source and the, uh, the epicenter of a, a very optimistic project, very um, something which we're really, really proud to be part of. I mean, if you look along the bottom there, you can see just quite how many different players and partners are involved in this. You've got companies like Orsted who are producing electricity. You've got Copenhagen Airport itself. You have SAS, the, the airline. You have Maersk, the shipping company. DFTS, if you don't know it, is a... Um, sort of a shipping company as well, but dealing with shorter journeys um, and many other players in amongst us. And what all this is bringing together is a concept where we will take utility scale offshore wind, that's gigawatt scale offshore wind, that will be taken to shore um, in this instance, close to Copenhagen Airport. At that point, the fuel will be put through electrolyzers um, where out the other side, the hydrogen will be produced. And that's gonna be used for a whole series of different uses. Some of that will go locally for transport but a large amount of that will then be used to synthesize jet fuel and shipping fuel um, to turn this part of Denmark into a huge synthetic fuel hub. Um, and to put it into context, then Denmark is looking at producing, you know, up to a third of the air fuel coming, being used in Copenhagen airport from that source by around 2030. Um, that is ambitious, but, but it is doable. Um, and if you look at those projects, if you actually look at the numbers just a little bit, it is very much phased uh, in a series of steps. It's starting off 10 megawatt electrolyzer, very small, very doable, just to begin to get the process going. It's then looking, actually that says 250 will step up first to 100 megawatt electrolyzer is the latest, will be an interim stage. Um, and again, and that's where some of the fuel will begin to be used for trials for synthetic fuel, for low demand levels of synthetic fuel. Um, learning as we go, the cost of hydrogen, as we know, it's gonna come down the, the cost scale. And this timeline, so around 2027 to get to 250 megawatts, gives us seven years for that cost to come down significantly. It also gives us enough time for the beginning and early stages of synthetic fuel production to advance, to move to a kind of low but significant level of production. And, and finally, the plan will be around 2030 to step that up to the full 1.3 gigawatts. So that's utility scale. Uh, and our vision, by the way, would be attaching that to a, a, an offshore wind farm based on, off somewhere called Bornholm Island. Um, but that that is what the project looks like. Um, the important thing for us about that project is just quite how many different players involved, just quite how many, and it just shows in this space particularly, Jane talked at the beginning that, you know, how much has been done in the power sector. But when you look at transport and the more you go into the harder to abate sectors in transport, the larger combination of different types of companies you need to get there. Um, so what does it actually take to get there from here? What are we looking for? Well, to kick the project off, actually all the companies listed there put in their own funding just to get the initial feasibility studies off the ground. There's, there's a huge amount of will there. You can see from the amount of people taking part in panels at the moment, actually being taking part um, in these webinars. And, and when you look around the industry, there's a huge amount of will to get this going. Um, us and ourselves and help fund the further feasibility studies and support from BCG. Um, and we've now worked out a combination with the partners and have secured with the Danish government in principle funding for up to the help with the first 100 megawatts of, of the project. 
So that will help with some of the capex and some of the opex. And as with all these things to do with hydrogen, it's bridging that revenue support gap, making sure that what you're doing is able to compete with grey hydrogen, with hydrogen which is producing large amounts of carbon. Um, and actually lurking in the background there is a piece of legislation coming out of the EU. I hope it's something that will start coming out of the UK soon as well in some of the amounts. They're putting in an obligation for certain amounts of aviation fuel to come from what they call sustainable, to be sustainable air fuel from sustainable forces, uh, sources rather. And so that's that's what we're looking from from this project. This will be one of those sustainable sources. Um, and finally, what can we take from this project? I think this is something which is replicable all around the world, quite frankly, certainly around Northern Europe, certainly in airports in the UK, in England and Wales and in Scotland. Um, there's definitely capability to do this. We have a huge amount of offshore wind resource in this country um, and certainly the, the chemical engineering expertise and capability to make this happen. Um, and, and finally, it shows me again, just to repeat just how many different companies are absolutely willing to make this work. And, and just as an example for that, Maersk has already purchased eight ships that it wants to run on e-methanol. Um, it needs its fuel in the 2020s. Um, people are making those commitments already, making those bets. And when you have that support from government, in this case, the Danish government, but we very much will see that we might be able to get some of the support from e.g. the Scottish government or the English and Welsh governments, then, then these are projects that can get off the ground. Um, finally, I should add, as a kind of hydrogen project, at the moment, this is portrayed in the feasibility study is based around a, a pure hydrogen supply. By that, I mean a dead offshore wind farm dedicated to hydrogen only. But as the hydrogen supply from offshore wind improves, you then do able, you're able to bring in some of the system benefits and the optionality if you want it to start running some of these offshore wind farms partially for hydrogen production and partially for electricity production. Um, using the electricity, for example, in times of the day or night when there's very low demand and the electricity is very low cost, whilst retaining the ability to you provide, um, produce used um, use electricity itself um, in the grid at times of high demand. Um, and I will leave it there. I'm interested to hear what other people have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. That's really interesting. And I do like this project. I know I'm an Ersted employee, but I do like this project, Green Fuels for Denmark. It'd be great if we can replicate it over here. Um, I think we, we do take learnings from Denmark. It's, 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 uh, it's interesting. Um, so moving on to uh, Ian Divers and not Scott Madison. So Ian, can I ask you to, uh, to talk about your your pipes. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jane. And apologies on behalf of Scott as well. I was looking forward to being here this afternoon. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Ian Divers. I'm the head of the Real ED2 project for SB Energy Networks. So uh, SPEN is the distribution network operator that covers uh, 3.5 million connected homes and businesses across our areas, across southern and central Scotland, north and mid Wales and Cheshire, uh, Warrington and Merseyside areas. I'm going to talk to you around about the challenge that we have ahead of us in terms of decarbonisation of transport in particular, but also across other low carbon technologies. So uh, just going to put a few slides to just step you through this afternoon. So we're looking at a, a pretty profound time of change um, for uh, electricity distribution networks more widely, which can sound like a bit of a cliche, but uh, as uh, as Russell was taking you through the view from national grid transmission of electricity, as we go down to the distribution network that actually takes it from, you know, the, the highways, the aeros down uh, through the networks from your town cities, up your uh, local streets and, and rural roads into the domestic property, up, up the driveway and into the cupboard under the stairs beside your meter. This is where the sharp end of the low carbon transition is going to be. And it's something we are uh, very much focused on as we look forward. And our, Rio ED2 project is the next contract with the regulator Ofgem that is currently heading towards our final submission of this in just a little over two months' time in December. And that sets out every pound we spend and every pound that we can earn over the course of the five years from 2023 to 2028. And as we think about the kind of the last three decades of, uh, of the electricity system since privatisation, that's been a story of improving customer service, of improving reliability of the networks, of reducing cost. If we look at this kind of pivot onto the next three decades and even before that, and um, for other parts of our country, and uh, to, uh, our role really has to be an, an enabler of net zero, and the spotlight will be firmly on us as as we seek to uh, uh, support and enable that change. 
So how are we going to do some of the urgency, uncertainty uh, of what we have ahead? And of course, the need that we have to formalise this in the business plan just shortly. So uh, uh, central to our plan and our look ahead is our distribution future energy scenarios. The defence, that's it's based on a view from the National Grid System Operator, plus the Committee on Climate Change, plus uh, local stakeholder engagement to really kind of bring to life what's the low carbon revolution going to look like over the course of not only a five year kind of period of time, which we have a regulatory contract, but ahead of that into the 2030s, all the way up to 2045 or 2050 for net zero. What you can see are those free clear dynamics, which would come as no real surprise to everyone, but that really what we're looking at is customer led revolution in terms of electric vehicles and particular not only domestic properties, but of course with public transport, because it has a pretty significant impact on our networks as well. If you look at heat pumps, they're going to go from, you know, it's, it's becoming more and more mainstream technology over time, particularly as legislation kicks in. And we have also on consultations that will come out just shortly and strategies as well from Bayes and others. So um, this, again, will be a, a really prominent area for us. And also, of course, we can't forget uh, distributed generation on networks today. Um, again, we, we see a significant increase between two and threefold by the end of this decade. Uh, if you look at heat pumps, a significant increase from you know less than 0.1 million to over to almost nearly a million by the end of the decade. And for electric vehicles, you know, going in to be getting on for nearly one in five, one in four vehicles being electric by the end of this decade. So really significant changes. And that has a big impact for our network, which has evolved incrementally over time, over the course of a century in reality, um, to accommodate you know, gradual change. And what we're looking at here is really significant changes in the space of 10 years, 20 years than what we've seen for five decades previously. And so that gives us a real challenge fundamentally to the principles of how we designed and constructed our networks. And it's not just us, but across the distribution network operators. And that really starts to rip up the rule book for how these have been built previously. And we need to kind of renew and rethink how we design, manage, build and operate your local electricity grids. So what does it mean in terms of the forecast? We talk about the DFES and it's it, it, it really at the heart of this, this is the kind of keystone of our plans going forward. And we know that this will be subject to change again. It's, it's, a, it's a range of scenarios. And what I'm showing here is kind of on the left hand side is how does this sit amongst the different scenarios we've uh, uh, we've put forward? So we can see again that the, the committee and climate change have a perspective on this. And we have to recognise, we have to recognise the, the regional governments and national governments that we serve as well, as well as the local communities. So that's when we talk to Liverpool City Region, when we talk to the Welsh Government, we talk to the Scottish Government, we have to factor all of these in. And as the only DNO is uh, to operate across all three, England, Scotland and Wales, um, as well as the UK Government, we know the kind of challenges that this brings. And as part of that uh, analysis on the left hand side, what we've led us to is actually on the right hand side here is just to see that kind of real spread of, of targets. And what we're showing here in the grey bar is really our range of credible scenarios, which we've determined through our leading an analytics that looks not only at electric vehicle uh, uptake probabilities, well, it might be a house that has a driveway, it might be on socioeconomic indicators, it might be on uh, for example, the housing stock itself. And um, also we've blended that with our network analysis to understand where is the capacity and we've built that, pull that all together into a leading model that's allowed us to kind of cover this, uh, a view of this range. And we're putting forward a proposal that we think is also, you know, uh, towards the lower end of this baseline, as you can see here from the chart on the right hand side. And also that needs to be linked very, very clearly, specifically to actions on the network. That's where we're investing in the different voltage levels, the different orbits of the network, if I could describe it from the home. So, you know, your local street, then into the local neighbourhood, the local town, the city. We need to think about where we need to intervene. And it can't just be looking at one solution in the space of five years, 10 years. We have to look all the way towards net zero because anything that we put in the ground today will have to be see out to 2045 or 2050. But at the heart of this as well, we know that this will change. You can already see in what's happening in the media more widely around the energy market over the course of the last week, two weeks, three weeks, that will have rippling effects throughout the energy system. People will be concerned about uh, obviously bill impacts. People are already thinking about the, the benefits of EVs. You can see the auto industry changing and shifting already. 
And so this will start to, the snowball will start to uh, grow as it goes downhill. And we have to be ready for that change. And that's why the, the ra- we are able to ratchet up our uh, policies and proposals to make sure we can accommodate that flexibility uh, and targets as well as that will seek to change. Because we need to understand, uh, and a heart of our investments is understanding what's going to happen in the network from monitoring, putting that through our analysis tools, and then deciding the right intervention. Because it might be, it might be cables and transformers that build extra capacity, or it could be flexible solutions to accommodate it within what we have. And that might uh, tip into, for example, renewable generators or distributed generators, or it could be customer behavior or others, other innovators, other entrepreneurs that we want to have access uh, to support us in the energy transition. But we know we need to do more. It's not just a, it's not one party in this process. And as, uh, as much as we look to our network investments and, our, and, our, and bringing in others with us in this journey, we know we can do more and we can see the, the challenges and the gaps between ambition and execution in terms of uh, rollout of EV infrastructure, but also heat, of course, as well. And so that's why uh, we want to go above and beyond in the future. And over the last few years, and I'll go around this quite quickly, some of our projects, innovation projects we've done um, uh, with some of our stakeholders to really push the boundaries of what a distribution network operator can do and deliver and actually support and facilitate the, the low carbon transition. So. Uh, briefly, so a top left and project we've called PACE. This is a, a strategic collaboration with the Scottish Government. Uh, we also have um, Scottish and Southern Energy Networks in this process as well. But for our part of this, uh, this process, we've established a, a, a significant increase in public charging access across North and South Lanarkshire. So areas that had the lowest provision of public EV chargers, as we work strategically to help enable the cheaper connection of those to the network. So we don't own the chargers, but we're able to part of a coordinated rollout strategy that's delivered real cost savings to taxpayers and crucially uh, access to public charging for those that uh, have less uh, means to do so. If you look into Project Charge, if you look into our, our, our southern uh, region around uh, Merseyside, North Wales, um, we can see uh, what we've done is again, providing transport and network analytics merge those to help identify where's the most effective, cheapest way to uh, connect to the network as well. Because again, part of this is information provision and sharing. And below that, again, supported by our EV Up project, which is looking at a number of uh, data sets and factors to, and again, a bit like, you know, does a house have a driveway, for example? How do we kind of build within these big data sets and actually look to see how does that feed into our understanding of what's going to happen out there in the network? and improve our forecasting robustness. And importantly, uh, the last in the bottom left, the Green Economy Fund, uh, which is uh, something we've done as part of our transmission business. We look to roll out in our distribution business, but really providing pot of funding uh, transparently uh, to our local green uh, innovators. So that might be use provision of uh, local uh, uh, renew, uh, green heat, uh, for example. Ed, ed, through electrification of heat or for transport, for example, to local communities, local businesses, which really it creates green jobs, it creates benefits in terms of environment and actually helps to foster and create that dynamic kind of green economy on a local scale and a local level. And it's something we, again, we've seen real support from uh, for stakeholders and we'll look to do more widely as we go forward. So, Quite a kind of a, a quick run through uh, a lot of this here, but really just in, to close in terms of some of the, the key aspects of this is that we know for, for DNOs and the electricity distribution system, this is going to be the front line of some of these changes, a real consumer led revolution. We, it means huge change, but there is big opportunities. It's actually quite an exciting, uh, in, uh, interesting time in the distribution network. We're going to see huge changes from what we've seen previously. And we're preparing ourselves now in, what it terms, I mean, in terms of the investment plan, in terms of the impacts on the network. But And we know that we will need to be able to respond quickly and to borrow, uh, to use a phrase that's kind of it's used a lot, to be more agile in how we respond to this. And But lastly, importantly, we know we're an enabler of change, but we can't do it ourselves. That's why we'll be more firmly in the spotlight as a company, sector, industry to be able to support low carbon transition. And so it's important that we start to build those strategic collaborations now to make sure that we can bring everyone along to get towards ultimately a just transition to what we're trying to achieve as well. So that brings me to close. So thanks very much for your time. And I'll hand back to June. Thank you, Ian. That's really interesting. And uh, the collaboration ex- aspect of all this is, is fascinating across sectors. I think it's something that we've not really nailed before. 
I've come from telecoms industry. We had to do it with mobile, broadband, fixed. We kind of got somewhere, but we didn't really nail it. Not sufficient enough to really deliver on net zero. So I, 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 I've got a couple of questions I'm going to ask you all in a moment. And please, audience, please send in your questions and uh, we'll, we'll do our best to answer them. So finally, but no means least, Amanda. Amanda, would you like to introduce yourself, where you come from and uh, your slides, please? Yeah, hi. So I'm Managing Director of Ulemco. We're a small SME based in Liverpool, but we've been very, very active in the hydrogen space. I'm also uh, the chair of the UK HFCA, uh, member of Shufka, the Hydrogen Association, and I've been working in the hydrogen sector for nearly um, 20 years. How sad is that? <laughs> um, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, and put that into screen sharing mode, sorry. Um, hopefully that's okay. Oh, I'm going back through the presentation, sorry. Insight to what I'm gonna talk about. Okay, so hopefully uh, you're, you're able to see that. I'm given the time scale and the wish that we all wanna to do to get some Q and A, I will float through as quickly as I can so that we can get on to some discussion. Um, so other people have already explained uh, why are we talking? Well, we've got less than 30 years to deliver 1.50 controlled emissions. And by the way, that means that we will still lose a lot of the polar bears, the glaciers and everything else. So we are in a crisis. We should be behaving like we're in a crisis. And one of the things that's already been alluded, uh, transport, the topic of today's session has done bugger all for the last few years. Um, lots of good progress in the electricity grid, little progress in heat, but some, but frankly, it's not good enough. And in the words of our favourite activist, blah, blah, blah. So we need to do something now. We need to crack on and we need to, to make some radical change now. Um, one of the things that moving to net zero has really helped in the last couple of years while we've been in pandemic and understanding is the fact that by going to net zero, we can't afford to leave behind sectors, the difficult to do sectors, which uh, illustrated in the middle includes heavy duty transport, uh, industrial heat, most of our domestic heating, uh, shipping marine and all those difficult pieces. We can't afford to not do it. And in that spotlight, uh, it's become increasingly acknowledged that hydrogen needs to play a role. Once you've got hydrogen in the system at something like 300 terawatt hours, we need to be making use of it, but we need to crack on and do that now. We can't afford to wait. And hydrogen in itself actually helps provide some of the other issues that we're experiencing in the energy system. It helps us provide storage, particularly seasonal. It helps on the other side of the of the game, reduce the offshore wind. Uh, Ersted previously talking about the fact that uh, an attractive proper proposition is the fact that pipes cost less than high voltage cables. So um, hydrogen's going to happen, and what we really want to do is say, well, what can we do with the transport sectors now um, uh, to actually take advantage of that? What does that mean? I'm going to now talk about heavy duty HGVs, goods vehicles on the road. But I would say that our technology and others, are, as previously alluded, been working about what the role of hydro can do in other applications, including marine. The graph in front of you is actually taken from the people that know Zemo and the folk like the APC that are understanding technologies. So there's 500,000 HGVs in the UK. Um, and we need to transition all of them by 2050, um, which is effectively, in, in some cases, only just over two asset replacement cycles, um, three just over R&D cycles from the automotive sector. Um, and I'm not going to have an argument. Uh, what the other guys talk about is, you know, about a third of the sector could go to electricity. Two thirds are likely to go to hydrogen. Um, I know the government is thinking about catenary, but frankly, uh, those that are in the know suggest that it could be a very expensive way of doing what we would want to do and reminding us that if we've got 300 terawatt hours of hydrogen in the system, then shouldn't we be using it in the sector more cost effectively uh, than a 19 billion investment in catenary? 
So I'm not going to particularly focus. I This slide talks about fuel cells and hydrogen combustion, but the fact of the matter is a large swathe of HGVs uh, uh, is pretty well known to get, want to be likely to go to hydrogen. Um, but I will draw your attention to the fact that we are here now, i.e. everything is diesel effectively at the moment. Um, by 2030, a large proportion will be diesel. Um, even by 2035, when the government is talking about banning smaller trucks. Uh, and in fact, by uh, 2040, uh, we will still have a significant proportion of the fleet running on diesel. Now, what we're trying to do is reduce greenhouse gas emissions now. So while we're doing all of that, and particularly in the early stages, we're not really making much inroad into the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, instead of diesel, what is there? Oh, uh, what is there? Well, there may be others, and I'll talk about that later in my slides. So what we really want to do is accept that we know hydrogen is going to be in the system and the great guys that have just talked about it and bring that back down to a focus by 2030. So we've already heard it mentioned that the Scottish government have a commitment for five gigawatts of green hydrogen to be in the system by 2030. Um, Disappointingly, the UK's strategy repeats the same number. So actually, everybody else out of the UK needs to not bother to do anything because, of course, Scotland's going to do it all and they're great and they're going to deliver that. That's frustrating. The industry has talked about 23 gigawatts worth of projects being available by 2030. So I really believe we should be upping our game. Anyway, even if we do five gigawatts, that's about 400,000 tonnes of zero carbon transport fuel, if it all went as a transport fuel. And at the moment, that's probably the only place that it could go. Um, and that will be possible to supply at prices competitive to diesel. Um, 400,000 tonnes in an HGV sector is probably about 15 to 20,000 HGVs, could be buses, that kind of application. So it's actually not a significant proportion of that 500,000. So it should be a no brainer. An interesting conversation with the Scottish Wholesale Association and all of their members run about that many vehicles. So we really need to be cracking on and using hydrogen, helping these lovely people that we've just been hearing from invest in their um, ambition for hydrogen um, by creating demand. And how do we do that? Well, we need to collaborate together to create clusters of demand that we know can be economic at around three to 500 kilos a day at a single location or equivalent to possibly having a fleet of vehicles doing about 250 kilometer round trips. So that's actually what's happening. And Scotland just definitely is leading the way. We've heard talk about bus fleets doing that and there's, um, and there's some discussion and progress on doing other applications. So if I was a fleet manager, what does that mean for me? Where everything that I currently use is diesel. Well, I'm not going to argue against converting an RT at the moment to CNG, which with a biogas certificate uh, will uh, relate to substantial CO2 savings over diesel based on the fact that that biogas is certified into the vehicle. Um, however, I would say biogas still is admitting CO2. So it's better or greenhouse gases as well. It's better than wasting that um, gas going straight to the atmosphere. So we're capturing it and using it and making it useful instead of using virgin diesel. But we are still putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. If they run, if, if an operator runs uh, any small vans in cities, it's pretty clear that actually they can have the option to go for EV vans. Three and a half ton vans upwards, slightly less obvious, but um, you know, there are some moves to being able to make that workable. Um, operators can consider hydrogenated vegetable oil and certainly in that whole swathe of diesel that's going to continue to be used. If we can replace that with HVO, similarly to biogas, that's a way of us using more useful carbon sourced fuels. And then there's some R&D and there's some R&D going on looking at zero emission freight, particularly for the 44 tonnes uh, application. Um, but it is R&D. 
I would contend and our company is involved in doing a technology that would enable diesel vehicles to run on hydrogen. It doesn't require asset replacement and it can be working with the existing vehicle technology. And that's hydrogen dual fuel. So I'd contend that how could we make inroads into the emissions that we have in the system at the moment, if we're running an HGV, we'll consider hydrogen dual fuel. And if you did, um, we would be saving substantial volumes of diesel related CO2 emissions if we converted an urban fleet in volume to run off hydrogen dual fuel. And that can be done now in the time it takes to build the hydrogen refueling station. You can have the diesel vehicles, Euro 6, low emission, running on hydrogen and being hydrogen enabled. So our technology involves existing assets, a hydrogen vehicle, a diesel vehicle. We add onboard hydrogen storage and we enable that vehicle to use a proportion of the energy coming from hydrogen. For every kilogram of hydrogen that they use, they will save 3.3 litres equivalent worth of diesel CO2 emissions. And actually, at the same time, because of the nature of the vehicle and the applications we're talking on, there's plenty of examples where in a in duty cycle they will also be helping to improve air quality over the diesel version that they're using um, so that's where we should be going what's problem what's what's standing in the way well we're a tiny sme based out of liverpool we've had plenty of taxpayer support in r d um, but the fact is investors in infra infrastructure today don't really believe that there's demand for hydrogen in transport because they're not aware of the range of technologies that could be operate and they need contracts to commit to volumes for them to make their business case. And the users, the vehicle users outside of those of us that are early adopters and understanding of the hydrogen, frankly, don't believe that they can get effective hydrogen supply. So we have a chicken and egg situation. Um, we also have government policy focused on zero emission going from hero to zero in one step or zero to hero in one step, I should say. And the fact is those zero emission solutions are not available today and they won't be for some time. Not at, for the majority of users, they won't. We're not only just there on passenger cars. Um, so in all of that case, the business case on both sides can't be proven. And the, the key of our technology and the dual fuel technology that we're, we're working with fleets um, to consider is that if they can use a proportion of the energy coming from hydrogen, they still have the diesel available if the hydrogen isn't, isn't uh, uh, available. Um, for the sake of the price of some zero emission fuel cell hydrogen tru uh, trucks, for three of those, they could do a whole fleet. That whole fleet, if that's collaborative together within the public sector and other partners working together, can help them get to a point where they can create demand locally that makes it attractive for the investors to invest in the hydrogen infrastructure. And actually, uh, I have to say, a lot of fleets are considering that as an option. And the, and the branding and the logos in front of you are a whole range of companies that are trialing and testing hydrogen dual fuel vehicles in a variety of different applications and the types of vehicles in front of us. I'll draw your attention to the fleet on the right hand side at the bottom, on right hand, my side on the bottom, uh, Glasgow converting a fleet of gritters to hydrogen dual fuel. They're waiting for the hydrogen refueling. Um, I believe that's coming any time. And those vehicles, once they get going, will be saving CO2 in real world use now. Um, so uh, just to conclude, um, uh, I show you the picture of the fleet in Aberdeen because we do sit in Europe with one of the best examples of the cluster development that I'm talking about in, in the whole of the world almost, uh, based in Aberdeen, where they've been working on the range of vehicles can use hydrogen. Uh, they're tendering for a hydrogen supply that would work together and, and really driving the collaboration to help get actual hydrogen infrastructure on the ground um, before uh, before 2030. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing and join you back. Thank you for that, Amanda. And actually, you've um, you, you've answered 
you've answered one of the questions that uh, I'd like to ask the panel. And I'm thinking that I'll come back to Mona because Mona, it feels like quite a while ago now that we first spoke to you. And the question that I'd like to ask is, having heard all the panelists, what do you believe is the biggest challenge and what do you think is your best next step? So going to Mona. Thanks, Jane. I think um, the biggest challenge is clearly, to my mind, around cost and associated with that chicken and egg problem that we that we've just heard about. And so I think the the answer to that, I, I, I do think there's a lot of mileage in that clustering idea, and we're really interested in that uh, within Transport Scotland. And I think part of the answer is. Um, was also discussed by um, speaker from Ersted earlier when we talked when there was a discussion about partnerships and bringing people around the table. Um, so I think from a TS perspective, we're really interested in mapping out demand, identifying where those clusters can be. We're doing some of that work now, and we're really interested in working collaboratively to try and bring um, a sort of centre of gravity and. A, to, to potential investments here going forward uh, and as I say really keen on working in partnerships so if anyone around the table is interested in taking those conversations further would be, would be keen on that as we progress the actions within our hydrogen action plan. Thank you Mona and going to yourself um, who do we have next Russell your biggest challenge and your best next step I think I think the biggest challenge, if you're looking from the infrastructure point of view, is, is which which way are we going to go and how fast and, uh, and and what infrastructure you're going to need to put in. So there's a lot of discussion about hydrogen. So a lot of discussion about electric vehicles. So what what are you going to need to invest in now? Uh, the energy sector is, is regulated, so you just can't speculatively put in infrastructure. You need to uh, convince the regulator this is the right thing to do because you're um, pay uh, using energy bill payers money and it's right that that's uh, officially used there so you have a little bit of this 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 kind of almost chicken neck so it's almost like how, how can we break that here and you can see a little bits of how you can overcome that there by the the way that we could look. there are certain things that are, 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 are more certain than others so we looked at light vehicles probably going to go down electric vehicles you can see electric vehicles uptaking so when we could talk about hydrogen there it seems to be that there's maybe a route around green hydrogen. Is that your first step investment? And then piped hydrogen is that further down the line? Here? So you start to see a little bit of certainty uh, come out in what that hydrogen economy looks like. We saw the hydrogen strategy published a couple of months ago as well. So there is getting more certainty around there. Once you've got certainty there, then you can start to see that investment flow. But like anything, uh, certainty so uh, helps with I I investment in infrastructure. And there are reasonable lead times in energy infrastructure as well. So it's key that those decisions are made as, as, as efficiently as they can be. OK, so that sounds like your best next step is get some decisions made. Richard, come into yourself. Biggest challenge, best next step. So so for a kind of a project like this, which is very much based in you know, reaching technologies, reaching like full capacity in the 2030s and 40s. Um, I think the biggest challenge is, is just getting that early support, acknowledging that actually to get there is going to take a huge amount of, of R&D and time and early early stage development now. Um, so, um, but I think in terms of the best next step, it is getting those consorted together. It's finding airlines, airports, shipping companies that want to work with us. Um, because I believe that when you get that consorted together, you get you can get a cluster effect, but you also get a large number of different sectors and all their best knowledge and all their best input. And it's also the, the easiest way to persuade others and governments, et cetera, of um, how serious we are. Yeah, thank you. There's a few themes coming through here. Ian. Yeah, so I mean, it's a good question amongst all the challenges. So between technical challenges, regulatory challenges, clearly as well for network operators. Um, um, economic challenges I think so we touched on there I think agreed that the economic challenge particularly in terms of upfront costs so even though I guess when we look at transport in particular it's, it's kind of similar in heat as well is that there's long-term savings benefits to customers but there's a huge capital barrier up front 
in doing so as well. And I think that hints at uh, what a few of the speakers have touched on, which is actually the you know that trade off or that benefit. How do you make sure those benefits are socialised more widely in terms of that just transition? So it's not just one sided, and you're not leaving people behind in it. But I suppose the, the, the next step, probably the the, I think that kind of commitment. I guess at a kind of a wider institutional level was probably for me the biggest challenge, because there is this is fraught with the complexity, fraught with challenge. There's a real behavioural, you know, uh, challenge here as well. There's a need for like you know real push on innovation, proof of concept, social proof as people start to move and actually support them in terms of cost in that transition. So I think for me is that kind of we've got COP twenty six coming up. I think there's a lot of riding on that and making sure that we come out of this with something that actually everyone has signed on to and that we can move forward with. And so that might be in the regulatory space, the institutional space, and just getting everyone kind of aligned on it and moving ahead because there's a lot happening around the, a lot of arguments, technical debates, etc. But you know, time's marching on and we don't have much time left in reality. So Yeah. I agree. Um Amanda, I'm going to ask you, but actually I think that you answered it during your presentation about the biggest challenge in your best next step. I think you did actually cover that. I don't know if you have anything to add there. Yeah, I, I just give that example that um, in the public sector, I think certainly in Scotland, there's been some really good support to try and help places like Aberdeen and that kind of stuff and Glasgow, but that needs to translate to the private sector. Um, now, a lot of the private sector are keen to drive and deliver roadmaps for decarbonisation by 2030, have high level targets. But I ultimately think that if there's a small piece of incentive put to help uh, positively drive people rather than negatively talk about banning, then I think we would get transition happen quicker. OK, thank, thank you. Um, I've got a question for Russell, um, specifically Russell. Um, could you let your dog in, please? I saw that. I don't have a dog. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, unless our neighbour's dog has come in, um, I, I, I'll see what that was. That's slightly different. Actually, I wonder if it is my dog. She got very excited when the doorbell rang a little while ago. Um, she does like a bit of attention. <laughs> OK, thank you. OK, there's no dogs here. Um, so there's a couple of questions about HGVs. Um, and I think this is very specifically, and I suspect Amanda it's addressing is to yourself, which is about HGVs running on biomethane? Um, yeah, that's, um, I think in the graph I talked about, I think the policymakers are driving to zero emission. So the graph is talking about uh, if we only focus on zero emission, the majority are still going to run on diesel. The truth is for biomethane today, there is a business case for some of the investors like John Lewis, Ocado, are, uh, are employing CNG vehicles. I think that's okay. But for the very reason that I pointed out, those vehicles will still be emitting greenhouse gases and CO2. So there is a difficult decision to go for that. I think people should do that. Um, and they also don't apply for every business case. So, yes, there's a case for biomethane in Arctic in certain applications. But for all the rest, there isn't a, a valid alternative. And, you know, uh, as I explained, HBO, some of the others are possible, but we need to uh, have a sense of reality of actually, you know, deploying hydrogen as quickly as possible, frankly. Okay, thank you. And I think we are coming to the end of the webinar. And I, I'd actually just like to leave it because I've got a question that's coming through for, for all of you, actually, because this is the final all energy one before COP26. And we are hopeful and I think there's a lot of rhetoric around the things that can be achieved there. But actually, what's your plan if it is a damp squid? What happens if it actually doesn't really bring forward anything and it doesn't really work? Um, so I'm just going to go around. I, Mona, I don't know if you're still there. Yes, Jane, I've just dialed back in. I didn't okay. catch all of the... the it was really just there. what's... I mean, we have high hopes of COP26. Um, and I really do hope it does come together. I think it's important for, I think, as a, as a post-COVID, um, England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland working together and actually demonstrating all that we can deliver. I think, it, I think it's actually a really exciting opportunity. But really, if it doesn't manage to kind of achieve over and above, what do you think? What's the next step? What's the, if we don't quite get everything we want out of it, do you have a view of and I'm going to ask everyone, I'm not picking on your self, Mona. 
that's a that's a beauty question. Um, I mean, clearly the 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 UK government as the sort of lead uh, delegation has got sort of quite clear international aims for the for for the session for COP26, and you know, part of those, I think the the Prime Minister has expressed some ambition. The road transport in particular. Um, I suppose regardless, and, and the UK of course um, is, is quite, from a sort of global perspective quite ambitious when it comes to what we're trying to do to decarbonise the road, the road sector and the transport sector. I think leaving aside the aims of the, the negotiated agreements, um, I, I do think that COP is certainly within the UK and of course um, well, within the UK, within Scotland, within um, all parts of the, the UK as, as the host nation, is really driving attention and focus um, and renewed focus across the piece on what we're doing on climate. So I am quite hopeful that um, you know that spotlight doesn't disappear post COP, and I think there will be. Uh, I think we can look forward to kind of a lot of closer collaboration as we go forward. Um, from a Scottish perspective, one last point and then I'll hand over to someone else is just that we have got our climate change plan update um, which uh, is refreshed on a regular basis so I think the next the next update is due in 2023 um, so I think that the, there's no letting up in the pace here uh, and and I would really hope to, and, and, and I know that hydrogen is going to be a core part of, of how we're driving towards net zero so I think regardless of what happens internationally on COP um, we'll, we'll retain that ambition within SG. Okay. Thank you, Mona. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left, so here we are, 30 seconds each. Russell, you're on mute at the moment. Oh, who are you speaking to, Jay? Sorry? Who are you talking to? Russell. Oh, Russell, sorry. Sorry. I just used up some of that 30 seconds. I'm going to say... <laughs> COP26 is not just about November, it's for the next 12 months and it's our chairing of it. So we need to keep up the pressure to make sure that actually the UK can deliver an impact, not just rely on the event in November. Thank you, Amanda. Richard? Um, I mean, firstly, from a, a UK perspective, I'm, I'm feeling positive already. There's a huge amount coming down the line. Um, Amanda, I appreciate. And just like we've got various things around hydrogen as well. We want a lot more detail and a lot more support. But there's a huge amount of focus on it from a global perspective. Um, I think you know it's not going to be zero sum. It's not. It's not going to be like we either get there or we don't. I think the worst case scenario is we get some of what we want, but not all of what we want. So I'm not that pessimistic. Um, but yeah, we've got, as Amanda said, we've got a long time. It's not just just about November. But I'm, I'm feeling broadly optimistic. I don't know why. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Richard. Um, Ian. Yeah, so it, it, very close to home. It's just the, the home city of where, uh, where I live. And, and to be honest, yeah. if it is a damp scrub, it's a good question. But uh, I think we need we do need to carry on because the real risks are, look, uh, I've got two young kids. You know, I, this is like we're in this the long haul as a society more widely. Look, we need to get to grips with this to stop the kind of wider uh, uh, negative impacts of what's happening today and the future. So we need to that I have trust and faith that it'll, it'll come together internationally. But the direction for us as a UK society is clear. Okay, thank you. And Russell. Is Russell, Russell, can you hear me? You're on mute. Have we lost Russell? I'm conscious. Um, Russell, I'm going to, I'm going to assume that you're going to say you're hopeful for the future and you are, um, wishing it well. Um, I'm really conscious we need to close out now. So I just want to say thank you to our panellists. Thank you for taking the time to prepare. Thank you for taking the time to present your, your thoughts and your considerations. And thank you to the audience for submission of your questions and sitting with us over this hour and a quarter. And please do feel free to share the, uh, the recording of the webinar. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.